Hello, everybody. This is Jake Sunzer, host of Jake and Gino Podcast. Here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, chef, the father, six, the best-selling author, the G Daddy. Told you so. Gino Bravo, Gino, how's it going? Jake, happy new year, brother. How you doing? Happy new year. It's the second, third, the fifth. It's it's <laughs> early, man. We're doing the damn thing. Always making it happen, big man. Excited about today's show. Today's guest is a decorated combat veteran committed to service, but is now on a mission beyond the military, Gino. What started as helping Marine friends invest in rental properties to pay the bills culminated into a company called White Feather, empowering military and veteran families to achieve financial freedom and live the American dream they fought to protect. So without further ado, Buddy Rushing, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for uh, setting this at seven o'clock in the morning on the second day of the year. That was really fun to get up super early after a night of uh, celebrating. So. Happy Dude, if, listen, if you're in the military and you're complaining about getting up at 7 a.m., we got bigger problems than that. So I'm going to forget you said that. All right. I'm just going to forget that. We're going to get the damn work done today. I got, I got the beard. I got, I got the post active duty beard going on. So I haven't gotten up at 6 a.m. in looks, a long time. It looks, it looks good, man. Um, let's hear a little. I'm very interested in, in what you're doing here and want to hear your story and, and the culmination of everything, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm uh, I'm 42, so my story is long, so I'll make it short, right? And uh, uh, but I yeah, I did the career in the Marine Corps, and uh, while I was in, my wife and I, we read Rich Dad Poor Dad, uh, like so many millions of us did, and uh, and decided that um, that real estate might be a way for us to um, you know to bring in a little bit of extra money. It didn't start by anything more grand than that. It wasn't like I vision casted this like thing. It was like, hey, let's buy a rental property. And see if this thing works, right? Um, and we uh, we can talk about later if if you'd like. The first rental property that we bought was a complete disaster. I bought it in 2007, June of 2007. Spent all our money renovating it, and then you know, of course, real estate dropped off a cliff over the course of the next year and a half. And um, so that was a disaster. Uh, can we pause reason, right there for a second? Yeah. Because I, I think you just touched on something super important and the light bulb just went off in my head. And I'm sorry to kill your story so early No, no on, not at all. But I think so many of us, it's almost a rite of passage because didn't have a ton of money myself, neither did Gino. I'm, I'm guessing coming from the mil uh, military, you didn't have a ton of money at the time either. No. So you, you save up these these pennies to put into a rental property or a fix and flip. And many times you, you lack experience, you lack the knowledge and the capital so it's almost a rite of passage. If you can make that first one work with with minimal resources, you can start to grow from there. So I think I think you experienced what many people do. And I just wanted to point that out. So if you're in the grind right now, if you're in that first one, keep pushing. OK, because it's a test to see if you're, you're ready for, for bigger and better things That's in it. the future. That's it. So it's the test. It is the test by and large that weeds out the people that are going to be successful in real estate investing and the people that are not one of the primary things that i've seen is just persistence and tenacity right it's not about like because here's another thing i'll say is like you see how many people were at the tail end or you know uh, have it at the, at the tail end of a 10 to 13 year up cycle depending on where you're at and kind of what it's by and large it's been a pretty smooth rosy ride in general in real estate for a decade or so and you see people now who last year got completely walloped and out of business because they had experienced a decade of just easy times and they hadn't built the necessary Dude, if rates system. don't come down you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg my friend that's right so. yeah and we and we could talk about that and we should talk about that right mm -hmm. because you know what happens is you see people who maybe didn't have to face that rite of passage at the beginning and they are a decade writing books like podcasts like they're the they're the person who's like building courses. Like I'm the guru because I've only won because it only they never really faced adversity from a macro market perspective. And then you see rates go from two and a half percent to seven percent in six months. And all of a sudden they're losing their mind. I'm not saying anything bad about them. I'm just saying they never faced that adversity. And so they but, maybe but never also had to they overextended it. themselves when when you're buying okay. things on variable rate debt and you yep. don't think anything's ever going to change and you're not insulating yourself from from rate risk. That's a problem, and that and that's yeah. a uh, I, I think a clear sign of inexperience and folks that aren't disciplined enough to maybe be in the, the game for the long term. In, in yeah, my or opinion. yeah, yes, disciplined enough, and also, um, I, what my favorite this is this is gonna make sense. Uh, my favorite movie of all time 
for a lot of reasons is Rocky, the series, my Rocky, the series, right? And the reason is because whenever I was, so I grew up on food stamps and like in, in a very, very poor part of the country, part of the state and part of the town, um, you know, no, not really. Uh, it was, it was East, uh, and that would have been a great story, but no, it was East Tennessee. Um, and so, no. uh, yeah, yeah. So I, so I, I, um, dude, I'm in Knoxville went, right now and you don't even know that. No kidding. No, I'm North of Knoxville or I grew up North of Knoxville. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I didn't even know that. Wow. Um, so I, I get, uh, I got scraped and clawed my way and got accepted into the Naval Academy, um, which was, you know, a huge deal for me. And I get there and it is so hard. The, so hard like the academics the the physical the the nature of it that like the academies that you don't know are very very difficult to get into and they're very difficult once you're in them to like survive right because because they're super demanding um and i struggled like crazy and i had graduated from high school at the top of my class everything had always because i was from a very small town and the, the academics were not hard and and there was when not there's a only lot of two of you. It's not hard to be number one, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it was, there were 32 in my graduating class. Yeah. So you didn't know that, but there's only 32 people in my graduate. So it's not hard to be number one, right? And so I get to Naval Academy, and there's just superhumans there, like truly. And I was like so scared, and uh, you know, I very very quickly discarded the idea of oh I have to be perfect, because like I was in high school, and I adopted the idea of as long as my heart is still beating. I'm going to keep moving forward like Rocky. Rocky was not a great boxer. He was a great fighter, a great warrior, right? And that was his thing is like, as long as you can keep moving forward and keep your goal in mind and take the hits, then you can eventually succeed. And my God, if that's not a recipe for success in business, tenacity and being resilient and, and learning from your mistakes, not letting yourself get bogged down to them, but learning from them and equipping yourself with those you know, the ability to pivot, the ability to let go of failures, the ability to march forward consistently, persistently toward your goal, then I don't know what is. And and I was very fortunate. I look at it right now as I was very fortunate to take a hit right in the face on my first investment. Like, and so when last year hit, yeah, last year was hard for everybody, right? It, it, last 18 months kind of have been really hard for everybody. And I've taken my hits along with everybody else, but never once have considered like, oh, wrapping it up because like you're just taking hits. You're just learning from mistakes. And, and it's that's a way of life now. And that's what I would recommend if you are in the grind for big people listening. If your first experience in real estate was a massive, embarrassing, gut wrenching experience. Awesome. Good. Get that like, out of the way. Get it. Yeah. Awesome. Got that out of the way. And you got a story. And also, if you keep moving forward, you now have shed behind 99 percent of the people that start. And then as soon as they hit adversity, they get Very out of the true. way. And now you have less competition. Buddy, my, what made you want to pick up the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? I was on a, what's called a, um, a motorized convoy, an arm, like an armored patrol in Afghanistan. Um, it's like these armored vehicles we go out. And at the time we were going out to uh, visit this uh, combat outpost um, in a pretty contested part of the country. Uh, and when you do that, you, you typically travel in like a long convoy of vehicles um, and it goes real slow. <laughs> it's it's not like what you see in the movies where you're blaring down the middle of whatever and just shooting at everything. It's not at all what it most of the time. Most of the time, it's very slow and methodical because you have IED sweepers out in front that try to find the roadside bombs. And so they go very slow. And so a convoy of you know, 20 clicks could take five hours. Right. And so you're just like and it's so boring. So I was sitting there on a you know, a pause and, you know, they had security everywhere. And so my job was just to sit there and wait until we could move again. And so I looked down to my left between the seat and the radio mount, and there was this little sliver of a purple spine of a book. And, you know, I was so bored. So I picked Somebody it up. Somebody left it there. It. Somebody <laughs> left it there. Yeah. I don't know who I, I never it was found divine out. intervention. Yeah. I ended up when I was finished with it, I left it back in the same spot. So hopefully somebody else picked it up, but pay it for it. Rich dad, poor dad. And I, I read it. I read it entirely in that one sitting. And then later that night when we got back to the fob, I read it again. And uh, so, so you did answer, leave it there. Well, yeah, I read it. Yes, I did leave it back. And that was my vehicle and my radio mount. So, yeah, I'm just messing um, with you, man. I uh, so I um, the answer to your question of what made me want to choose Rich Dad Poor Dad is extreme mind numbing boredom. <laughs> it's just not a great answer, but <laughs> I think it shows you. Yeah. Oh, I oh, I know for a fact. I know for a fact I am a for a lot of reasons. 
I'm a huge believer in things happen for a reason. Um, only because I've seen it. I've seen many things in my life, including, you know, the very first firefight I was in where I ran out of this like doorway and I had a, uh, an armored vehicle, a Humvee up to my left that had the 50 cal on it. That it was where I really in all likelihood, I probably should have gone there in order to return fire with a 50 cal, but I didn't, I turned right to go to the wall to call in artillery, uh, with my radio. And as I turned right, uh, 107 rocket smashed into the doorframe to my left. I've got a picture of the hole that it left. If I had turned left, that would have hit me. I turned right. Damn. And you can say whatever you want about that. Oh, well, coincidence, whatever. That's one of like many, many, many instances I can say, like violence and nonviolent, that I'm like, man, like there's so, there's so many odds against that. You know, and I personally, I'm a believer. I believe in God. I believe that there's order in the universe. It's very, very difficult for me as a scientist, as a, and I'm a, um, my undergrad is aerospace engineering. So I have an engineering mind, scientific mind, very difficult for me to believe that this is random. There's just so many instances where it's not. Um, but I, uh, but I look at that and I think to myself, okay, if there is, if everything does happen for a reason, then what is the reason in my life? What, what am I supposed to do? Right. And what are we supposed to do? Why are we having this conversation right now? What's supposed to come out of this? And if it's not something good, then, then we're wasting our time. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think it is something good. So I think, yes, to your point, I think the book did choose me. And I and we've seen what has happened from that uh, because I've gotten to meet a ton of great people that share this vision. And you know, thousands of lives have been impacted because of people that we've met and all the stuff that they've done. And it's amazing. What did you get out of the book when I want to say golden nuggets, what really left an impression on you after you read the book? So you have this belief, or at least I did, whenever you grow up really poor, um, that that life is not for you. It, that's a Hollywood life, like the life of, you know, owning your own home. Like that's crazy. Right? <laughs> or like having more than one car. Like that's nuts. You know, like why, how did, or, or, or any of that. It's nonetheless, like vacations and all that other stuff. You don't think that's for you because it does. It seems so far away. And you mentioned something before the show about mindset, about mindset being like the most important part of all this. You don't even think about things in terms of mindset as a poor kid. Like you, you don't. It's not a conversation. You talk about practical things like food and 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 you know like I don't know. You never. So the biggest thing I got out of the book was it really convinced me that. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you start. That real estate doesn't care. Real estate never asked my last name. It never asked what race my dad is. It never asked any real estate doesn't care. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's there for you. And especially in America, you have the ability. And that's one of the things that I love so much about this country is that, you know, no one has ever, no bank has ever asked me like my mom's Mexican, my dad's white, and we grew up super poor. No bank has ever asked me how I grew up. Or, or, or well, what, what, no, let's be honest. A lot of times they'll ask you what race you are in the bank form, just to be fair. Right, right, but it's optional. So they do a little right? bit. <laughs> it's optional. It's optional, and you can put go, uh, go after yourself, right, if you want to. So, so like, you know, I mean, they, but my point is, like, the options, it, it, the book convinced me that I could change, if I choose, chose to, that I could change the direction that my family went, that my children could have a different life than I had, different life than my parents had, and so on. Um, and that real estate could do that. That was the that was the big thing I took out of it is, is the belief that I could be a part of that. So after you've read the book, you put the book back away where you found it, you leave the military. What are the next couple of steps that you take to, to get into real estate? Well, so I didn't leave the military for another 15 years. <laughs> and so- wow. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I was at the time I read it, I was a first Lieutenant. Um, and then I ended on going all the way to Lieutenant Colonel and, you know, did several more combat deployments and, and, um, and everything like that. Cause I, you know, I'd love the Marine Corps. I, I had a phenomenal career, phenomenal time with it. Love the Marines that I, um, and I did a lot, like, as I learned more, um, I, I began to teach Marines and that's really where this became what it was is, you know, uh, my wife and I decided to just dive into educating ourselves. We're like, after we did the horrible first investment, we we're like, the reason that screwed up, I could have done 30 seconds of analysis and told you that was a terrible deal. Now, forget about the 2007 crash. Like, even if I didn't know that was going to happen, the deal itself was garbage. And so, I, you know, because I didn't know anything. 
And so I was, we were like, let's educate. So we dove into educating ourselves. And uh, the more we learned, the more we'd love to share because I love to teach people and everything. And, and it wasn't organized. We would just, I would just share it. And so over the course of the next 15 years or so, uh, my wife and I, we did all kinds of different investing ourselves, for deals and, and joint ventures and self-directing our IRA and investing in notes and all this kind of stuff. Nothing big because we still, it was only funded from my salary. So like if we didn't do big deals, but we did a lot of different types of creative deals because we had to, didn't have a lot of money. And so that lended itself to having a large array of different investment strategies that we could talk about. And because mm -hmm. I love to blab about it, and when you're on deployment, especially, you have a lot of time to talk about stuff. And so everybody knew me as like the real estate guy, you know, and um, and that led itself to about six years ago when I, I, I developed a relationship with a guy that was a turnkey provider in Memphis, right? Uh, so, so for those of you that don't know, a turnkey provider is a business where they'll buy properties off market that are unrenovated, and then they'll renovate them and place a tenant. And then they'll put management with it and then sell it to an investor that just wants to buy a property without any hassle or, you know, without finding it themselves. And so he had a bunch of inventory and we had wanted to sell our properties here in California and start buying Midwest properties that just cash flowed a lot better and, and better landlord tenant laws and so on. And it worked like a charm on like three or four deals that we did. And so I said, Hey man, I've got a boatload of Marines that have been following this story for a long time. <laughs> right. So you can see where this is going do you have any other inventory? And he's like, bro, that's what I have inventory, right? Cause this was 2017. So he was like, I got like 35 properties coming down the pipe. And I was like, all right, I tell you what, I'm just spitball this here, right? What if I bring these guys to the table and I'll show them how to analyze the property so they know what they're getting into. And if they buy from you, then you give me, you know, a referral fee. And he was like, yeah, let's do it. Awesome. So within two years, we had, by word of mouth, bought 300 properties from them and built this group, and it uh, and it became at that point kind of an the unstoppable Memphis Marines force. is everything in Memphis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the 300 that we bought were all in Memphis. Then we expanded to St. Louis, and Little Rock, and Alabama, and then Florida, and, and now we're all over the country. But yeah, it started with a conversation like that on a Saturday so, morning in February in Memphis, of 2013. You know. So, Walking buddy, what are the challenges for people who are in the military when they want to invest? Is it mindset? Because we were talking before we hit the record button. Is it mindset because it's not as entrepreneurial, the organization itself? You're saying it's hierarchical. Um, what are the challenges do, do people in the military face when they want to invest? The biggest thing I would say is fear of um, investing in something you can't see yourself. I think that first and foremost, right, because entrepreneurial is more about the business that you build later, right? Um, investing in a rental property is not necessarily entrepreneurial. It's, you know, and I would tell you by and large military people do want to invest in real estate. That's what I've seen. Like probably nine out of every 10 people that I talk to in the military express some interest in investing in real estate. I, I'm not sure why that is. Um, probably because they have the VA loan and, and they're encouraged to buy properties at their duty stations. And so they know that real estate can be a, a vehicle, but it's fear. It's fear of it, the biggest thing for sure is that, well, I'm not there. Like, how do I, how do I protect the property? How, what do I do if something breaks? Like all the questions that you guys hear a million times. And that's what it is. First, it's getting them, showing them that systems and people and all that stuff can get them over the fear. Uh, but to your bigger point of entrepreneurial, think about this for a second. The military, right? The, the, the larger military. It's let's, let's say the Marines. The Marines' job is to enforce our nation's policy all around the world rapidly. It's an expeditionary force, right? So that's primarily, it's amphibious as well, so coming from the sea, but it's also expeditionary, which means get on your doorstep fast. And so, and if necessary, enforce that with extreme violence, right? And so I can tell you when you're in a combat situation, the, the key to success primarily as, you know, a guy on the ground is doing the ordinary in extraordinary circumstances. It's doing basic blocking and tackling stuff. Take a knee, return fire this direction, calling, you know, quarters. It's, the stuff is pretty simple to learn. But when you're getting shot at, your heart rate is skyrocketed, like your your brain's going crazy, like your, you know, you know, the cortisol's shooting through your body, like ordinary things like your hands are shaking because 
you know, there's so much adrenaline in your body. And so it's hard to like dial numbers, right? You don't think about these things whenever you're in a classroom, right? And so be being successful in combat is about doing ordinary things in an extraordinary situation. That does not bode itself well to creative thoughts and to, and to expressing yourself and, to, and to, to getting into, you know, a sense of flow so that you can creatively link disparate ideas, which is what a lot of times being in business is. If it's finding creative solutions to things and so on. So that in and of itself probably would like lend itself to people thinking more linearly and not creatively. Um, with the rare exception, like you mentioned before, of small teams, right? You said you were talking to a Navy SEAL last week that their job a lot of times is to find, I mean, they do those things as well. They do the extreme combat as well, but like they also do a lot of things that require creative solutions um, and small teamwork which is forming bonds and it's, you know, it's relying less on the hierarchical rigid system of the military and more on building teams, which isn't that what building a business is. It is. And I, as you're speaking, I'm writing notes down here because I want you to say that one more time, doing ordinary things in an extraordinary situation. And it's really muscle memory. If you can learn how to invest in real estate and then when you get overwhelmed and you find the deal, you can sit down with a clear mind, not get overwhelmed, stay focused. That's why Jake is always saying, buy right, manage right, finance right. What's your buy right criteria? All of a sudden you see a deal and you're freaking out. You're not sure. But if you know what you're looking at, it's an ordinary thing in an extraordinary situation because you finally found a deal. You've looked at 150 deals. I don't have any deals. I finally found one. What am I supposed to do? And you just calm yourself down. And it's sort of the same thing. I mean, hey, listen, you're not going to die. I'm just, I'm just trying to make a parallel here where. No, no, no. That is a parallel. That's a really good parallel. And it's probably an incredibly useful parallel because what I've found is that people often have, especially in the military, they often have difficulty translating the things that they learned in the military into useful endeavors in the civilian world and what you've just yeah so, so I, I like to say a lot of times there's when, when you're re investing in real estate right there are no immediate emergencies but that and that means like in the next 20 minutes i need to do this otherwise everything falls apart there's rarely rarely ever anything like that and if you're in that situation you've probably done a series of things wrong right mm -hmm. but there are true challenges and extreme situations where you can feel a lot of pain in a lot of ways the, the crushing anxiety and despair of your family maybe losing their home because you screwed up that in a lot of ways is is just as toxic and bad as like you know the the the, the prospect of of you know maybe getting hurt uh because and i can tell you for this i mean i'd rather somebody break my arm than my family suffer because of something that i did mm -hmm. and so so there are parallels and you do need to keep your head. It's just keeping your head over the course of days and weeks when you're going through a storm is sometimes more difficult than keeping your head in 10 minutes of extreme situation. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good, no one's ever brought that parallel before. So thank you for that. You know, buddy, the other thing with what you do in the military, and I got to give kudos to a lot of the people in the military, they have so many different skills. They have project management. They really have systems and they have processes that they have built in. And they're, they're actually excellent for investing. One of our coaches, Vince Gethings, big shout out. He lived in Hawaii. He's buying deals in Michigan and he's buying deals in Texas at the time a couple of years ago. And he can project manage. He has that ability. He has that skill. So anyone listening who's in the military, dig down deep inside. You have a lot of transferable, amazing skills. And one of them is leadership. Can you touch upon leadership? Because when you're buying real estate, your first or second deal, it really is, hey, it really is buying real rental real estate. But by the time you got three, four, and five, all of a sudden at Jake and Gino, we like to say, you become a multifamily entrepreneur. You become mm -hmm. a leader of your little bit, of, you know, and whether you have five units or 5,000 units, it doesn't matter. You still have a cash flowing business entity and you want to be able to scale that. So as far as leadership, how do you, bring the leadership that you've learned from the military and into the organizations that you're working with right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say, um, for me, it's, it's, it's easier to relate military leadership, um, and, and the culture because in white feather, like we focus primarily on military veterans and their families. Right. So there are a lot of people that I'm working with that have that shared background. And so it's definitely way different in that I'm not in charge. <laughs> They're like there is not, it's a, it's a pack of lions. It's not me in charge of a bunch of people. Like, and, and it, it's so funny seeing the interactions. You would see that very quickly. 
Um, mm-hmm. But they do look to me for for education guidance and then, you know, uh, things like that. Um, but what I would say for in building a portfolio, you're right. The first one, you know, you're just in there looking and jabbing and you're doing everything yourself and, and you're, you're just kind of figuring stuff out. Once you get, and if you especially want to scale to financial freedom, then whether it's an apartment building with a hundred units or, you know, uh, a bunch of quadplexes or, or, or like a smattering of what you tend to find when people that don't focus primarily on apartment investing is they'll have a few short term, a few uh, single families here. They'll have some multifamilies here and then they'll have an apartment complex here. And so it doesn't matter. Like you said, it doesn't matter because you still need to have a team of people. Otherwise you're going to go crazy. And it's not, you don't have financial freedom. Like a lot of people mistake wealth or net worth with financial freedom. They are not necessarily correlated because if you have a million dollars of equity and 16 rental properties and you're making tons of cash flow, but you can't take a Tuesday off to come hang out at the beach with me, you are not financially free. Like, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, you're wealthy, you have plenty of money, but freedom is the optimal word here, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to have the freedom to be able to do whatever you want. That's how we define financial freedom. In order to do that, to your point, you have to have a team of people and they have to understand the common vision and they have to be motivated and incentivized to do what you need them to do which means you have to understand what they want and you have to help create a situation where they get what they want by giving you what you want. Mm-hmm. And Zig Ziglar said this, right? He said, get help enough people get what they want and you'll get what you want. Mm-hmm. So you've got to start with providing value and understanding like how do we help their dreams come true? And if we can create a situation where in helping their dreams come true, mine also does then this will work. And if we can't, too many people force it. They don't worry about that or they can't figure it out. And they're like, ah, let's just do it anyway. And then, you know, then they wonder why somebody gets burned out, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and I've made that mistake. I have made that mistake and I'm sure you guys have as well. Like you'll, you, they're misaligned incentive structures and people just leave or they (laughs) quit or they get burned out. And, you know, so that, that's really it in building a team is, is helping, helping create a situation where people are incentivized to, to do what, um, helps their dreams come true. If I can expand on that answer, I would also say the great Stephen Covey says, seek first to understand, then to be understood. And yeah. most of us don't do that because we're, it's all in it for us. What's in it for us? I think and that was those... Yoda, Gino. <laughs> was it Yoda? Nah, it sounds what? like some Yoda would it, say. Well, it wasn't a Darth. Hey, you know what? Everything comes from uh, comes from uh, this great Stephen Covey, and it comes actually it all comes from Napoleon Hill. To be completely forthright yeah. with you, Jake, you know, you read Napoleon Hill and you read all these people speaking today. It's like holy crap! Guy wrote yeah. took twenty five years of his life to write a book, and now everyone's just basically ripping everything Pull off. Pull a chapter said. off and turn it into three hundred pages. I know, <laughs> which I know. is great. No, but to, to my point, it's really it's really having empathy, really having the understanding of what the other side wants, and the problem is that most of us have a paradigm. We have an understanding, a frame of when you say something is we're looking at it from our lens, from the way we would look at something. And that's an important thing for real estate investors. Don't think that the person selling the property, all they want is the best, the most amount of money, the highest price. They may want a quick close. They might just want to get rid of the property. They, they may want to find someone who's a little bit younger and saying, hey, I want to give you the opportunity that somebody gave me. So don't under, don't think you know what the situation is. See first, to understand that situation. That's really important. Uh, buddy, last thing before we go to the short answers, any resources? If I'm in the military and I want to learn more about real estate, I mean, Jake likes to call it the purple Bible, and I tend to agree. It is. I mean, you know, it's, it's probably the best-selling book all time in business. And I would say 80% of all of our guests have read that book. And it's Wait, really impacted their lives. What else have you done? What other, what other resources would you recommend to the listeners? Yeah, I, I, I will tell you, it's yes, you're right. It is the best-selling personal finance book of all time. Um, and, there, and there's a reason for it. But I will say it is literally just the mindset shift Mm-hmm. That's all it gives you. Um, and now bear in mind that horrible deal that I did that was the first deal ever was after I read that book. So it is just like, let it be what it is and don't try to make it anything more. It is a mindset shift. And then you have to continue your education, right? To learn the tactics. Otherwise, you know, you you just know strategically what to do, but, but then you can stumble on the tactics. Um, so I personally, um, I invested in, in, you know, I started going to real estate investors associations and networking with people and finding resources through those through my local RIAs. 
um, I took the courses. I, I took several courses. Um, I took the New Wealth course and the Rich Dad course and all these different things. And so, um, you know, obviously there's the, you know, the community that we all know and go to, Bigger Pockets, right? Bigger Pockets has a lot of really great free education. They have some really good paid education. <clears throat> if you're a military person, the the purpose of this community that we built. Now, I want to talk about this for a second. So White Feather, th think about White Feather is the business we built, right? It's 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 one that that ultimately brings military and veterans in, teaches them what they need to know, and then helps them build financial freedom. <clears throat> but the, the real, we started with White Feather. And we necessarily started with people who could take action and could invest and could do all, right? That's people who have built up capital, people who have good credit scores, right? The vast majority of military people and veterans when they get out don't fit that mold. And mm -hmm. so we created a community that is a free community that is about reaching those people. We created that last year, right? And it's called Veterans for Financial Freedom. So if you go to veteransforfinancialfreedom.com or .org, we have both of the URLs then you can look at the community and, you know, you just fill out your information and it's free to join. And so you can get information, you can get access to education. And um, we have calls, master classes, all kinds of stuff that we want to bring to that community that ultimately will help people, you know, one, join a community of people that have served like they have and are who are building financial freedom just like them, right? So the most powerful thing that we've got from feedback is the community is the biggest thing. Feeling like you're home again, because when you're in the military, it's kind of like you're in a fraternity, I guess, or a sorority or whatever is how I can relate it to civilians or, you know, um, and, and it, you're a part of something. You're part of something that you care about. And whether or not you know it, you need it. And then when you get out, the civilian world is like, you know, the, nobody really goes out of their way to like check on you. <laughs> you know, you're kind of on your own. That's what we've heard over and over again from people. So this community is really about you know, feeling like you're back with the, back with the, you know, the military people. So anyway, veterans for financial freedom is a, is a great place for people who can go to, to seek a specific military focused, um, community. Thank you. Cool. All right, gang, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Now we have had a great run in multifamily going from zero units to over 250 million in assets. That's over 2000 apartment deals that we've been able to purchase through our framework buy right, manage right, and finance right. Now Jake and I, we created the Jake and Gino community back in 2015. We launched our first book, Build Our Profits. And since then, our students have closed over 60,000 units. That's over $4 billion in assets they've been able to close over the last six years. And that's why this community has been so successful. We call it results-based education, and we pour back into the community everything that we've learned on our journey from zero to 2,000 units and all our systems and scale that we use on our very own property management and investing company. Jake, I love that. It's not just education, it's implementation. So what I want you to do, click on that link down below, apply to work with our team, see how we can help you on your journey in multi. All right, we are back. And I've been meaning to ask you this. Any relation to Tony Romo? I am not. I'm not. Oh. Okay, I, I was just sitting there and I was like, am I speaking to Tony Robo? It might be the headset. I don't know what it is, but I just wanted to get that out of the way first just to confirm that. Okay, we can move on. Um, any of the it. investors that uh, have gone with you and, and done the turnkey stuff, gone on to you know say, hey, I like this, but I want more and have started to create their own portfolios and their own real estate businesses? A huge amount of them. That's the point, right? The, 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 oh, you're like, the gateway drug. Yes, the goal, the goal always was to create uh, business builders. Because the, the, if I just, like, you know, my thought was if I just create a community where they come to me for everything, then I'll never be able to truly grow it to generational impact. It has to be greater than me. It has to be greater than the small team that we have. And so what we do is we bring people in who want to be business builders. And we've had people that have gone on to build far bigger businesses than I have far bigger portfolios than I have. I mean, we've got one couple, Carly and Jared, who went through the Real Estate Accelerator, which is a training program we have together. And then they went on to build a $150 million empire in Jacksonville, Florida, right? Crazy. They started from zero, right? And I mean, they had some capital, but they started with, with zero real estate in, in Florida. And they went on and they have, I think it's 150, maybe $130 million of, of multifamily properties in Jacksonville. 
um, that I, I personally am invested. Probably a third of my network is invested with them now as a limited partner, right? And they were students. So they so did like syndications that, uh, following uh, that. How did they yeah. how they start to scale that? Uh, well, they so they started with one small apartment complex, and then you know, so bear in mind the community, the white feather community is about six hundred people now around the U.S. And, um, and some of them have gone on to be very successful. And so they've got pretty deep capital pockets. And, uh, and so what they did, what Carly and Jared did was they turned back into the white feather community and said, Hey, we've got this deal is, you know, and then I facilitated the conversations and then we all invested and that's how they started it. And then, you know, they just built on that success and we just, you know, kept growing. Um, but yeah, so are the, they are they the replacement now for the turnkey folks in Memphis? Is it is it no, is just continuing to grow? I'm just messing. With that. They're the augments, right? So so yeah. so they're what the one common problem that we've always had is there's always more investors than deals. Like I've never been able to have enough deals for all the investors. So what they do, I mean they they augment that, right? And um, you know, meaning we got enough others. vetted deals because there's a tons of deals out there, right? Or is, is it just that yes. you guys vet deals in Fantastic. a certain way? Like I, you, get, you yes. need to like uh, elaborate yes. on that. Yes, that is such a good point, Jake. Like such a good point. Enough deals that are vetted and are of the quality that we would be confident investing in ourselves. And even those deals sometimes go bad, right? So like, you're right. There are more than enough deals that are out there, but I don't know, like, you know, you, you have to be really, especially in today's market. I would say anybody listening, like you want to be very judicious in how you analyze and underwrite your deals, because even some of the best deals that we've invested in, the macro forces have caused them to face headwinds that like just stalled and slowed stuff down. So yes, okay, the, the answer to the question is there, there, we never had enough super high quality deals to, to, you know, serve our investors. And so that's what, that's one of the things that it helps when you know, like the, the, operators the limited parties if they're students of yours that that you know the education they've had you know their character and integrity then that takes that gets you a lot of um a lot of the way toward being able to confidently invest in a gp right because we know that it's i mean you guys tell me if this is wrong you're the ec apartment investing experts how important is it that you trust in the integrity and you trust in the capabilities of the gp versus the deal itself how important is that I think it, I think it's wildly important. I, I also think that to your point, um, we did a few syndications. Uh, we started off just buying our own deals, and then we, we said, "Hey, the syndication thing is, is interesting." And my point is that we actually, after we did three syndications, we realized that the quality of the deal flow, to your point, was such that we're we don't need syndication money. We just wanted to try it out. And so because we're only seeing less than a handful of super high quality deals per year, that was actually our transition back to just buying deals internally because we were seeing, you know, a handful of deals that we really wanted to take down. And we're saying like, why are we doing this syndication thing when we just are going to buy these things ourselves? And so I think it's a, it's a very real point that when you see a deal that you want to do, what do you want to do with that? Do you want to go out and syndicate that deal? Or is it something you may just want to buy yourself? And so I, I do believe that as, as the GPs that, um, you know, it's, it's very important since I've only been a GP in my life and only relied on myself that I, I think having enough confidence in someone else to manage your money is, is a huge uh, vote of confidence that you put in someone else. And there has to be a lot of trust there. And so uh, those, those two things have to align other, because if one of them goes bad, the deal falls. Right. Yeah. And then and then in addition to that, if, if they don't buy it right, if they don't manage it right, if they don't finance it right. All those things that we talk about, the deal is going to fail. So there's a lot of opportunities to stumble along the way. So, uh, I, yeah. But, Jake, I think out we are a little bit different as well. We are geographically challenged because we're we're vertically integrated. So we're only going within three hours of our radius. So if you're looking, you know, you know, countrywide, there's a lot more opportunity than what we would come across. That's why we're very choosy. And there's a, there's a lot more opportunity for messing something up too, because each market comes with its own risks. Yes. Right? Yes. So, but, but to answer, you know, buddy, your, your, your question, I would always relate it to a jockey and the horse. The horse is really important. The horse is the deal. The horse may or may not crap out. It's the jockey. It's the sponsor, the, the GP that's riding that horse. And if something happens, you want him to take control and you want him to or her to do a really good job with that opportunity because there are going to be challenges. 
and you mm-hmm. want that person who's the fiduciary of your funds to be responsible, to be transparent, to be communicative, and not only speak to you when things are going really good, but when they're going really bad. So I would say the deal is important, but I think your goals and what you're trying to accomplish and the jockey or the sponsor are of the utmost importance. You need a jockey with a headset. <laughs> right? Is that what you're saying? I guess that's what I'm saying. You 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 read me so well, brother. I like it. Um Lastly, what uh, what projects are you excited about right now? Are you guys uh, still investing pretty hard this year? Have you pulled back? You know, kind of give us the the layout. Yeah, so you know, it's interesting because we're um, the high interest rate environment. Call it high, just for the sake of argument. Let's call it high. I know historically it's not. It's higher. There's no doubting that it's higher, right? So, so the real key is a 14, 15 month surge where rates went from three percent to eight percent, right? So that's Regardless of how historically high 8% is, 3 to 8 in that short amount of time span created ripple effects. And so um, what we have right now is, you know, about six, I don't know, I'm sure you guys know this, about 60% of the mortgages in America are sub 4% interest, right? And 40% of those are, are less than 3% interest. But you have a higher amount of equity and savings than ever before, which means foreclosures in the single family world, foreclosures not super likely, not a wave of foreclosures because people have low interest rates. They have plenty of cash reserves and plenty of equity. And so, you know, you see that situation, but then you've also got a ton of, well, two things. One is you've got a ton of investors, white brother investors specifically who bought properties in 2017, 18, 19, 20, 21. And they have, I have a bunch of my properties, investment properties at 2.875 rental properties in Memphis that are cash flowing at 2.875 interest on the mortgage. Well, I'm in the process right now of selling one of those at 5.75, right? I sold it. I bought it for 127, right? It's, I, I refinanced money out of it and got the rate down to 2.875. I owe 140 on it. It's worth 220. I'm selling it for 199 with 30% down and 5.75% carrying back the mortgage. So what that creates for me is cash out, but I preserve the underlying financing and then I'm selling the note to an investor. And so I'm getting literally more money out of it than if I'd sold it for 220 on the open market, but I keep but the the buyer gets a great cash flowing deal at 5.75, right? Which is mm-hmm. good rate. The note investor is getting upwards of, you know, 20% cash on cash return, which I don't need to do that, but I decided to do that to like spark this movement, right? And I get all my money out of it. So it's called selling on a wrap. So one of the things that we're doing right now is a ton of arm. We're structuring a, a um, we're structuring a business arm that allows our investors to sell their properties on a wrap. And what if I decided to hold that note instead of selling the note? Well, I've got actually more net cash flow from that note at the higher interest than from my actual rental property right now. After all expenses are taken into account, mm-hmm. so I know that's complex. But if you can wrap your head around it, so then you why are you selling look- your note? Because I want to create a movement. Like I want, like I'm selling the note to spark a bunch of investors uh, inside our community. See, one of the most powerful parts of being a part of this. Or does it just feel good to have the cash and not worry about it anymore? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. Because bullshit, because a little bit. Come on. <laughs> it, it does, I'm, I'm only getting like 18 grand off of the note, so it's that that's not enough cash. Dude, to be 18 excited. grand is 18 grand, man. That, that buy some groceries. Well, you know what's more so. important than that? What's more important than that is word getting out that being a part of the white feather community is a place where you can get 20 percent deals. Then I get more people wanting to come into the community to take part in the deals, to run through the training program and so on and so on. So yeah, I'll forego the extra cash I can make by creating excitement about the community. That's really mm-hmm. what, what it's about. And I'm open about that. I tell them, this is why I'm giving you this deal because tell your friends, right? <laughs> so, um, but that's something we're really excited about is we're wanting to buy and sell at least probably for the next six to eight months using rep investing um, depending on what the rates do, if the rates come back down to five and four and a half percent, then this, it loses a lot of its potency, you know? Yeah. Um, but right now it's very, very powerful strategy. You got, dude, you got like four months. I know. Well, hopefully, <laughs> right. Hopefully because on the other side, I've got a bunch of lots and there's South an election. Florida. There's an election this year. It's, it's pretty much a guarantee, my friend. So <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. That's a, uh, Man, what there's, an interesting there's money time pretty, to be There's alive, money huh? printing in place right now that's going to be happening this summer. Rates are coming down. Uh, let's frolic for a little bit, and then we'll see where it goes. Um, yeah. Gino, take us home. You have a young buddy who lives in East Tennessee, and actually in our Woo! neck of the woods. Rocky Knoxville. Top, baby! 
and he is in a school and his class has got 30, 35 students in it. And he's saying to himself, I'm in the Naval Academy. I'm with the big boys. And I think I'm a pretty big boy because I'm number one out of 35. But when I get there, I am crushed, man. These guys are superheroes. I mean, they're wearing capes and I'm just this regular guy. But I learned one thing while I'm there. I learned tenacity and I learned grit and I learned hard work. And when I get into the military, I'm in the Marines. I'm sitting down in my Humvee one day. I look down and I see this purple book and I pick it up and I read it in one sitting. Go back. I read it again. I put it back down and I let it simmer. And it sparks in my mind a revolution of I want to become financially free. I want to take control of my financial education, my financial life. And what, what Jim Rohn says, you can be in Niagara Falls on a boat without a motor and without an oar. And all of a sudden, downstream, here 500 feet from death. It would have been nice if someone told me a few years ago to buckle up and get ready. And that's the interesting part of the story, how it culminates with Buddy. He not only started investing for himself, he learned the art of investing. He learned how to make money and how to create value. And all of a sudden, he created his uh, his investment community for all of the you know, all of the veterans out there who want to get into real estate. And, you know, it's an awesome story because you're creating impact for yourself and for your family, which is great, which is really important. But the more important thing is I think God put you here to be able to create impact for others. And that's what the mission is, to be able to help those who don't know or who have never been subjected to this type of, I guess, mindset. Because, you know, a lot of us grew up poor, grew up disadvantaged, didn't know. And we thought, hey, all we need to do is get food, <laughs> clothing, and apartments. Those are the basic human needs. But life's not just about the basic human needs. It really is about trying to live a life full of opportunities. And, and money allows you, to, allows you to do that. And investing in real estate ultimately allows you to do that. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Gina, let's go to the videotape. 16 people have survived Niagara Falls in a barrel, just to set the record straight. <laughs> and gang, as always, we believe in buying deals for the long term. Think in decades. I'm Jake. He's a G-Daddy, and we make it happen. We'll see you next time.